Uh, so, uh, good, good morning. Um, do you think that we can do it without the mic, or would you prefer? The I think mic? they want to uh, huh? webcast and record the talk, so that's why they're using okay, the mic. Okay, okay. So we, we we need it. We can hear you, but I think they want the mic. time to start. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, as many others, I want to start with thanking Dan, whom I can see here, and Ben, and uh, Morai, who I don't see, uh, for uh, having me here. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, opportunity to come here. It's always a great place uh, here in Cambridge, and uh, this is a uh, especially a nice mixture, I thought, uh, many exciting, interesting talks. Um, okay, uh, I will also tell you a story about cold atoms in optical cavities that we've gone through uh, during the past few years. And uh, I want to begin now to uh, show you my collaborators. Uh, basically, uh, there is, uh, as an important part of the theory support uh, by these uh, Four uh, fellows uh, from Hamburg, Ludwig Reza and Michael, and Prasanna from Innsbruck. And uh, we have an experimental team, obviously, uh, with two uh, teams of uh, PhD students, uh, the old team and the new team. Uh, these two guys are the old team, uh, they are now graduated. This is the new team, and they are the phase of learning. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, well, soon, hopefully, sort of take over. So this is my outline. I will <coughs> basically show you uh, different aspects of uh, a system consisting of uh, BC inside a standing wave cavity. And it will turn out that depending on the way how light is coupled uh, to this cavity, fairly different uh, physics arises. This is uh, sort of my, my, my order principle uh, for this talk. Uh, so you see there are different kinds of uh, coupling uh, that you can uh, choose, and depending on that, uh, I will show you uh, uh, different aspects of uh, the physics uh, that you encounter, uh, recoil resolved cavities as a scattering. Uh, we have looked at in situ uh, block oscillation detection uh, in, in this uh, scheme here. Uh, if you have uh, a single-sided uh, transverse coupling, uh, there's uh, physics uh, that uh, sort of uh, connects uh, to meta-wave superradiance uh, uh, as it has been uh, looked at in an old experiment by Wolfgang Kettley. And, uh, <coughs> well, in that case, uh, we are into the extended open Dicke model, and I will show you uh, <coughs> how we can do quenches across the face boundary and what happens then. And uh, also, uh, at larger lattice depth, uh, <coughs> one can sort of combine the Hubbard model uh, with uh, the Dicke model in the sense that uh, uh, self-organized uh, mod insulator uh, can be put together. And, uh, well, I close then uh, with uh, telling you also in one slide, I think, uh, what happens if uh, you work with unbalanced coupling. Uh, and uh, there's a crossover between quite different kind of physics, uh, matter wave superradiance uh, and self-organized, uh, 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 self-organization phase transition. Okay, this is the cavity uh, uh, that we had in Hamburg, and uh, uh, the main point, uh, apart from the fact uh, that it has a high finesse, uh, the main point is uh, that it has uh, a length of five centimeters, uh, which means that uh, at a finesse of uh, 340,000, uh, uh, the cavity bandwidth is on the, in the kilohertz regime. Right? That makes it pretty different uh, from uh, all other cavities I know. Uh, in one 
sense it adds some interest. Uh, in another sense, uh, it makes it hard to operate uh, because uh, your laser has to be well behaved uh, to talk uh, to this cavity. Uh, okay, so we are strongly cou coupled, uh, as I'm showing you here, and uh, uh, to do to be strongly coupled, we need something like uh, several ten thousand rubidium atoms in our BC. So these are the four coupling scenarios uh, I will discuss: uh, <coughs> axial coupling, uh, transverse traveling uh, wave, transverse standing wave, and transverse unbalanced. Now let's go to axial coupling. Uh, this is kind of uh, the most uh, elementary way of uh, thinking about a cavity. Uh, everybody has seen something like that at some point. <coughs> we couple the cavity uh, through a laser, uh, through one of the mirrors, and uh, <coughs> well, our cavity is uh, recoil selective. Uh, the recoil frequency is uh, uh, three point uh, something kilohertz, uh, and that uh, well compares uh, with the cavity bandwidth of uh, 4.5 kilohertz. So it's important uh, to uh, well sort of uh, draw these uh, different kind of momentum states. Uh, this is where the BC is uh, prepared, it has zero momentum, and uh, scattering photons uh, from the atoms that will uh, uh, populate uh, these dis discrete momentum states. Uh, and here I'm plotting uh, basically the elementary processes that can happen, uh, starting uh, with the BC at zero momentum. Uh, you can shine in a photon here, which is blue detuned with respect to the cavity resonance, uh, and uh, well, you transfer uh, your uh, BC uh, to, the, to, uh, to this momentum state, uh, usually uh, to both momentum states. And uh, yeah, <coughs> if you do that, uh, then uh, after that has happened, after the atoms uh, appear in, in the plus minus 2 h by k states, uh, nothing more can happen uh, because uh, the cavity bandwidth, uh, which is indicated uh, by this gray bar, is so small that uh, processes uh, that take more than uh, uh, four recoil energies, uh, which is the distance, energy distance from here to here, like uh, this process uh, that takes uh, uh, 12 recall energies to go from here to here, it cannot happen. So there's, a, if you want, a sort of a scattering blockade. Uh, every atom can uh, scatter a single photon, uh, and then it, the cavity takes it out of resonance uh, for further scattering. Okay, uh, and uh, in the same way, uh, you can uh, imagine a situation uh, when your PC is prepared at these two states, uh, then uh, by um, having a, a red detuned photon impinging on the BC, uh, you see uh, that you can uh, transfer the atoms back uh, <coughs> in the zero momentum state and uh, sort of recover your BC. <coughs> the process uh, that, that these kind of scattering processes uh, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, they are super radiant uh, in the sense that I want to explain to you uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this figure. Uh, like if you start uh, and you couple in actually to the cavities, the, there's a standing wave, uh, the atomic density is <coughs> flat to begin with, uh, and this is, uh, if you want, uh, the momentum spectrum, uh, and then uh, a little bit of uh, backscattering uh, can occur, uh, despite the fact uh, that this uh, density distribution is uh, homogeneous, that there's always uh, fluctuations, quantum and thermal, uh, and uh, then the plus minus 2 HYK uh, that uh, states become <coughs> occupied, and that uh, leads uh, to a little bit of a lattice commensurate uh, modulation. Uh, and uh, as soon as that is there, uh, then a scattering uh, is constructed uh, from uh, every lattice site, and uh, uh, kind of in an exponential uh, uh, way, uh, there's uh, uh, a pulse of light uh, appearing uh, in the cavity. Uh, and uh, well, that can go on, uh, more and more atoms uh, uh, appear in this structured uh, distribution, uh, but at some point, uh, if you cross this situation uh, when half the atoms are in the plus minus 2 h by k states, then uh, you see uh, that second uh, peak uh, comes up here. Uh, and at the end, uh, if everybody is in minus, uh, plus minus 2 h by k, uh, you see uh, that again the distribution has uh, been, uh, come to life uh, that is not superated, uh, that uh, terminates uh, that, that emission. Uh, so <coughs> that shows you uh, that uh, what you have to expect is that there's a pulse of light uh, interacting with the atom, and after that, <coughs> it's done. And uh, this is how it looks uh, in detail. Uh, let's look at this, these two graphs first. Uh, I'm showing you here uh, the time uh, that we've switched on uh, the axial coupling. 
uh, and uh, at the beginning uh, there is no lattice uh, in, inside the cavity. Uh, and then what you see is there's a, a, a small uh, time period uh, where things are oscillating, and then uh, sort of a steady state level of, uh, uh, of light uh, is, is uh, produced in the cavity. And what's happening here is uh, basically uh, that uh, in the beginning uh, you have processes like that uh, where uh, you excite uh, the atoms uh, with the frequency omega p and uh, a shorter wavelength, uh, uh, a longer wavelength photon is emitted into the cavity uh, to transfer uh, the atoms from here to here. And uh, obviously uh, now we have photons, uh, two frequencies uh, that make a beat, and this is the beat uh, between the frequency uh, uh, that's emitted into the cavity and the frequency that you offer uh, through your axon, uh, uh, coupling beat. And once uh, everybody is, uh, all the atoms are in these two states, uh, uh, this kind of process uh, uh, is not happening anymore, uh, as I was showing you before, and there's a, uh, uh, a constant level of uh, light, uh, a lattice of a certain depth uh, in the cavity, uh, and things remain stationary. And uh, well, you can do that uh, for different pump strengths, uh, and then you see uh, curves like that. This is at uh, this strength here, uh, or this curve at that strength. And uh, you see these oscillations uh, that at some point termin uh, terminate, and here you see uh, the steady state. Right? And this is a, a mean field calculation uh, that basically shows the main features uh, of, uh, of this process. OK, uh, you, I also want to show you that. Uh, this is already a few years ago. Uh, if you apply uh, such pulses uh, as I was showing you, uh, you get uh, the, this kind of uh, beating. Uh, uh, and the atoms are transferred uh, from uh, zero momentum uh, to plus minus uh, 2h per k. Uh, if you take a momentum picture after this has happened, uh, this is how it looks. Uh, and then uh, here we have uh, <coughs> subsequently applied a reddituned pulse. Uh, so now uh, we're doing uh, what's depicted in this uh, detail here. We have a reddituned uh, photon and uh, we are recombining uh, the atoms back in the BEC. Uh, and uh, this is a second pulse uh, that is uh, uh, applied here. Now, uh, as I uh, uh, told you in my uh, introduction, uh, we have looked at uh, <coughs> in situ monitoring of, of block oscillations uh, using the cavity uh, to get uh, sort of a, a non destructive uh, uh, method at hand uh, to, uh, uh, to detect block oscillations. Uh, this is a typical block oscillation signal uh, that uh, many people uh, produce uh, in optical lattices. Uh, and uh, <coughs> what we can do is that uh, we can look at the light transmitted through the cavity. Uh, that's this blue curve here. And we see uh, uh, that uh, <coughs> the same oscillation, the same frequency uh, shows up <coughs> in the light transmitted through the cavity. Why is that interesting? Uh, well, um, uh, block oscillations are used uh, by uh, people doing precision met uh, metrology, uh, for instance, uh, uh, measuring little g, uh, acceleration sensing, and uh, if you want to do that uh, very precise, uh, you need uh, high data acquisition speed, uh, and uh, that's uh, hard to do uh, because in a curve like that, uh, for every point uh, you have to cook a new BC. So that's time consuming. Uh, if you can look at uh, such an oscillation, uh, uh, which is, comes from a single point here, uh, uh, you have gained a lot of time. And uh, so that's good for the metrologists. And uh, then a question arises, uh, um, <clears throat> well, first, why is that so? Uh, why is there an oscillation in the intracavity lattice steps? And uh, that is very easy to understand. Uh, a block oscillation means that uh, we are traveling uh, with our wave packet uh, through the brilliant zone. Uh, if we start here, uh, our block function uh, will have basically uh, a large constant contribution and a little bit of lattice commander wiggle on top. Uh, and as you drive up here, uh, the, um, the contrast of this uh, comment, uh, lattice commensurate wiggle uh, gets larger and larger at the end uh, it has standing wave character if you're at the end of the brain zone that corresponds to the fact that this is where Bragg scattering uh, occurs right? uh, and now you see uh, that uh, uh, these different uh, ways of how the block function looks like uh, uh, leads to a different uh, 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 leads to different strengths in the coupling uh, of the photons uh. So this uh, density distribution obviously couples stronger than this density distribution, and because of that, uh, the line profile of the cavity shifts uh, as the atoms uh, move uh, through the birds. Uh, 
And if you put your uh, coupling laser at some point, like uh, for instance, uh, ready to uh, where this bar is indicating, uh, then you see uh, that you're uh, sort of in an uh, oscillating way uh, drive into resonance and out. Uh, and that gives you uh, your intracavity uh, lattice uh, that oscillates. Um, <coughs> well, an important question uh, that comes along uh, with all that is the, uh, the question of whether the Bloch frequency depends on all these cavity parameters, uh, and uh, there's a theory uh, predicting that this is not the case, and this is why we've uh, taken a little bit of a look at uh, how that is, uh, and uh, this is just basically uh, different measurements showing you uh, that the Bloch frequency, which is plotted here in the y-axis, does not depend on uh, all these typical parameters uh, that you like to do uh, if you play with your cavity, like number of atoms, uh, uh, which corresponds uh, to the cavity resonance shift or the strength of the coupling uh, uh, or uh, the effective detuning of uh, your light beam that you couple to the cavity uh, or the number of intracavity photons, uh, question of how deep you make your lattice uh, <coughs> to do that. Uh, so everything looks like uh, that's uh, a method uh, that not us, uh, but other people who are doing metrology uh, uh, might want to use. Okay, so now we come to transverse uh, traveling wave coupling. Uh, so we have a single beam uh, coming uh, from uh, the left. Uh, and um, yeah, that may remind you uh, of an experiment uh, by Wolfgang Kettler uh, some time ago, I think 1999, yes, um, <coughs> where he has been just uh, shining light uh, from the side uh, on a cigar shaped uh, Bose condensate, uh, so no cavity there. Uh, and that was enough uh, to see these kind of uh, uh, pictures in momentum space uh, <coughs> due to the fact uh, that um, uh, scattering processes of these kind here uh, form a lattice uh, <coughs> along this direction that interferes uh, with the incoming uh, light beam. Uh, the lattice uh, that forms uh, is shifted in uh, frequency uh, uh, due to the recoil <coughs> that's emitted. Uh, so uh, it's a moving grading, a uh, moving density grading arising. Uh, uh, so there's uh, the, for this moving density grading uh, with, fulfills the Bragg condition uh, for efficient scattering uh, into uh, uh, on the axis of this uh, Bose condensate. Uh, there's a, a kind of a super radiant uh, uh, pulse uh, that is emitted uh, <coughs> Uh, into into the BC on axis of the BC and then all these different kind of momentum states are occupied. Here. This is the experimental picture uh, that they were seeing. And uh, now, if you just put a cavity around uh, your uh, BC uh, in that situation, uh, that's basically uh, uh, what I've been plotting here. And uh, <clears throat> well, again, uh, you have to consider uh, the different kind of momentum states that can be reached uh, by scattering processes. Uh, um, well, scattering <coughs> photons are from the incoming beam here <coughs> uh, into the cavity, and uh, you see uh, that it's the momentum states on the, the right uh, <coughs> half plane uh, uh, <coughs> due to the fact that we don't have uh, any, any uh, beam in Kabota coming from this side. Um, <coughs> now, one point that's important here is uh, that these different kind of scattering processes going from here to here, uh, or from here to here, that take different amounts of uh, uh, energy uh, to be uh, transferred uh, to the atoms. Uh, and uh, as I told you, our cavities recoil resolved, uh, so uh, it makes a difference uh, whether uh, the energy transfer needed is 2 e recoil or 6 e recoil. Uh, we can dial that in uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, tuning uh, the frequency of the photons uh, coming in. So we can put the frequency such that only uh, the 2 e recoil process uh, is, is happening. Or, uh, if we have atoms to start with uh, at uh, the two zero mode, uh, then uh, we could dial in the six recoil process uh, to uh, bring the atoms from here to here. Uh, and I will show you how this how this works. <coughs> so uh, concentrating for a second on the two recoil process, uh, uh, so this would be the process uh, where uh, either of these uh, uh, scattering transfers happen here along these two possible passes. And uh, <coughs> well, important point once again is uh, to see that this uh, momentum transfer occurs in uh, a super radiant fashion. Uh, and uh, well, this is basically seen uh, if you <coughs> well uh, start here at uh, zero with the BC. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> this corresponds to the BC, corresponds to homogeneous distribution of the density. Uh, once you uh, populate uh, the 1 1 state or the 1 minus 1 state a little bit, uh, uh, a moving lattice uh, uh, arises, a uh, lattice uh, that uh, is uh, uh, fulfilling bra the BRAC condition uh, for further scattering. Uh, so uh, this lattice is exactly uh, what you need uh, to have scattering um, uh, cons uh, consecutively interfering uh, for every lattice site. And this lattice moves uh, the velocity h by k over n. Uh, and once uh, you push all the atoms uh, here, uh, going further on, uh, further scattering, uh, uh, then again uh, you are uh, uh, in a homogeneous uh, distribution and the process uh, sort of terminates, self-terminates. Uh, so this should happen in a, in a short, uh, superated pulse. Um, before I show you uh, such uh, uh, scattering pulses, uh, I very briefly want to discuss uh, uh, how you can uh, uh, sort of understand uh, what will happen here. Uh, this is the stability analysis, uh, uh, where uh, simply uh, the uh, equations of motion have been linearized <coughs> around the solution uh, where no scattering occurs. And uh, what you see is the system is uh, instable <coughs> everywhere. Uh, um, yeah, what is plotted here uh, is basically the excitation rate uh, that, you can, uh, that you can calculate. Uh, so the further you to the right, uh, the faster uh, the uh, system wants to leave the state uh, where no photons are uh, emitted into the cavity. And uh, you see uh, that uh, the uh, uh, potential surfaces here, uh, they look like, if you want, uh, parabolas uh, more or less uh, tilted uh, uh, by 90 degree. Uh, and uh, the cusp of this parabola is exactly a two recon. Uh, so the system is uh, most unstable uh, if you uh, uh, apply light uh, that exactly lets you go uh, from the zero momentum mode to the two h by k momentum mode. Uh, that's, that's not, not surprising. Uh, maybe. Now, this is a dynamic assimilation uh, uh, where uh, we simply uh, um, ramp up uh, the uh, intensity of our uh, pump beam uh, uh, in five milliseconds uh, from uh, some value, that, well, from zero to some value of like three-year recoil. And uh, you see uh, that uh, along uh, one of those uh, uh, equipotential surfaces, uh, 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 the, the scattering occurs here uh, in, a, in, a, in a short pulse. So what's plotted here uh, is the number of photons seen in the cavity. <coughs> And this is uh, the, the, uh, the experimental observation of that. OK, so now, uh, just to show you an example, uh, if you uh, shine in light uh, that, uh, well, sort of uh, satisfies a resonance condition uh, for the two recall process, uh, starting at the BC in the zero zero state, uh, this is what happens here. Uh, in the cavity, uh, this is a uh, time axis, uh, when you ramp up uh, the uh, strength of that beam, uh, this is the red dash line, uh, indicates ramping up uh, the uh, in couple light intensity. And you see uh, that basically nothing's happening uh, until this instant of time. Uh, you, at the time instance of one and two, uh, you see the BC is still there, nothing happened. Here, uh, there's a spike uh, of light emitted into the cavity. Uh, and as you see, uh, uh, this leads to this process uh, happening here, and uh, once, uh, like at four uh, here, you're already in this situation. Uh, nearly everything uh, has been pumped up to the two zero state, and after that, uh, nothing more is happening. Uh, the BC remains uh, <coughs> in the two H by K state. Um, so that's dialing in uh, the two recall process. You can dial in uh, other uh, processes like. Uh, tuning your system uh, to resonant with the six repair processes, these this blue uh, errors. Uh, and, uh, well, definitely, uh, since the BEC uh, in initially is in the zero, zero state, uh, it is the two repair process that has to happen first. Uh, so you have to wait a little bit of time. It takes longer uh, for that to happen. Uh, but eventually it happens. You see it here. Uh, this happens here at three uh, in this red area. Um, so atoms are transferred uh, to these states and uh, further on uh, to that state. However, uh, uh, this cannot uh, fully sort of uh, come to an end uh, as it did uh, when, uh, in what I was showing you before. Uh, 
But before this process ends, uh, it is terminated by the fact uh, that resonantly the sixth recall process uh, sets in, and it empties uh, these states. Uh, and emptying these states means uh, that the, the grading uh, that makes the first, uh, the two-way recall process a superradiant uh, is terminated uh, by the next process. Uh, so the six-way recall process kills the two-way recall process. And this is why uh, uh, a good amount of atoms remain uh, in the uh, in the zero order at the zero zero at the zero zero momentum state. And uh, <coughs> well. Uh, so then uh, we are populating uh, these two states, half, half of the atoms remain here, the other half uh, uh, goes here uh, after some time. And if you wait, uh, uh, then higher order processes uh, set in and you can uh, populate uh, <coughs> higher momentum state. That depends on how you set your detuning uh, <coughs> in detail. Okay, this is uh, just to illustrate uh, that there's control in all this. Uh, 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 this is... Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, well, a, a game that we've played uh, uh, to make a super uh, atom accelerator, uh, starting with the atoms in the zero zero state, and then, uh, well, first uh, dialing in the two Eureka process, going here, going here, going here, and so on. Uh, you can do that uh, forever. Uh, however, uh, uh, you have a trap, uh, and at some point the atoms rolling up uh, your potential in the trap, and that, uh, that, that terminates that. So you see what you have to do uh, to go from here to here to here to here. You have to adjust your detuning uh, to make it. Uh, well, it's resonant uh, to the uh, process uh, that, uh, that you want to happen. So we start uh, with uh, this process here, then the detuning is uh, changed uh, to be resonant uh, with this process and so on. And you see each time you do that, uh, a spike of light uh, <coughs> is emitted in the cavity uh, to do this transfer. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, here you can see uh, that we should end up uh, with 10 H, uh, H bar K but uh, we're only ending up uh, with seven point something. Uh, this is due to the trap. Okay, so now let's uh, go to the transfers, uh, standing wave coupling, and uh, a lot of this has been said about that uh, by, by many people. Uh, I'm, I'm not able uh, to, to note all the people who've contributed uh, here, uh, especially in the theory side. There are many interesting uh, theory papers uh, about uh, uh, the system. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in this case, uh, you have heard already a few times that there's a self organization transition, and uh, in some parameter space, uh, this is uh, sort of uh, uh, a simulation or an emulation, if you want, uh, of the open Dicker model, uh, uh, closer to the uh, uh, self organization uh, phase transition. How does that come about? Well, if you have two lasers uh, from two, both sides, a standing wave, then now you have uh, the full uh, 2D uh, momentum plane at hand. Uh, uh, all these states uh, can be, in principle, uh, contributing. Uh, and uh, you see that now uh, there's something new uh, becoming possible. Uh, again, if you shine in uh, photons that are blue detuned with respect to the cavity, uh, resonance, uh, you can excite your system in the way I've shown you uh, uh, for the case of a single. Uh, uh, this would be uh, this kind of process is uh, bringing the atoms up here. But now if you uh, shine in a retitude beam, uh, there's a possibility of going uh, down into the uh, sort of a red region of this uh, uh, diagram. Uh, uh, and uh, well, the fact that now you can build up a stationary lattice, uh, this lattice uh, that you uh, build up here uh, is uh, no longer traveling, uh, but stationary, uh, you can get a stationary state uh, uh, that you can pump your atoms into. And once the atoms are down here uh, in uh, your self-organized lattice uh, in the lowest band, uh, then uh, these processes that take you down there don't have to happen anymore, they terminate, uh, and uh, you have a stationary state uh, where uh, photons scatter back and forward uh, and maintain your lattice. Okay? So just, uh, well, very briefly, uh, since uh, you've uh, seen all that, uh, this is how the self-organization uh, transition uh, basically occurs. Uh, you start uh, with the situation of intensity of uh, these in couple of beams is uh, low. Uh, in that case, you just have a standing wave along this axis. Uh, the position of the atoms along the vertical axis is, uh, is arbitrary uh, at a certain strength. Uh, uh, scattering uh, sets in, uh, and uh, uh, the interference uh, between the standing wave being built up in the cavity and the one uh, that you 
uh, have externally applied uh, leads that to this kind of uh, checkerboard uh, uh, templates. And uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, this, um, this is sort of uh, uh, associated with a homogeneous atomic density along the cavity axis, while here you have a, a stationary intercavity optical lattice. Um, <coughs> From the many-body perspective, uh, you can say uh, that, uh, and this has been uh, uh, talked about already, uh, that uh, yeah, photons mediate uh, a long-range interaction uh, between the atoms. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the same as well. However, we have a retarded interaction. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, the uh, evolution of uh, the matter variables and the light variables uh, happen on the same time scale. Uh, uh, means uh, that uh, <coughs> you cannot integrate out the light field, and uh, uh, due to that, uh, um, the, there's a retardation uh, in the interaction uh, uh, between atoms at different places in the cavity. Okay, uh, this is uh, um, a linearization uh, analysis, a stability analysis, uh, where the system is linearized uh, around the, uh, what I have called here NSF, a normal superfluid mode. Uh, so. Uh, no scattering yet, uh, the uh, atoms are in the uh, initial BC. Uh, this is uh, giving you, this analysis gives you the uh, Dicke equilibrium phase boundary, and you see uh, that uh, all this uh, Dicke physics happens on the left side uh, from the zero here. Uh, so this is at red detuning. Whereas at blue detuning, uh, you remain in a situation now where the system is everywhere unstable, uh, and uh, you basically have the same kind of physics that I uh, telling you before uh, for a single uh, beam. Uh, so here you expect a, a super radiance instability as before, uh, spikes of light being uh, uh, emitted into the cavity, while here a stationary lattice occurs. And this is also seen in an experiment. Uh, uh, now, the colors are uh, fairly similar, but I'm plotting here something else. Uh, this is the intercavity <coughs> photon number uh, that you see. Uh, this is our uh, Dicke equilibrium phase boundary here, uh, and you see uh, that, uh, well, this is measured in a way uh, that the pump strength <coughs> is ramped up linearly uh, here in time uh, uh, in 10 milliseconds. So, what you see here is typically uh, uh, pump strength is increased, uh, you cross the uh, Dicke equilibrium phase boundary, uh, you go further in, and then it happens here at a little later. Than, than you would expect uh, if this was uh, equilibrium physics. Uh, on the other hand, uh, at blue detuning, uh, exactly uh, what you expect uh, happens. Uh, you see uh, that there's, uh, uh, on one of those uh, equipotential uh, surfaces here, uh, uh, the superradiant uh, emission of a spike of light uh, occurs. These are these points here. Uh, you can also see uh, that uh, if you look at the momentum spectrum at this specific point, uh, you see exactly uh, what happens uh, uh, if you look at matter wave superradiance, uh, the kind of pictures I've shown you before. You excite the system uh, uh, into the plus minus uh, two uh, uh, H by K states, uh, whereas uh, if you're on the left side, uh, red detuning, uh, uh, you're creating a, a stable stationary lattice. Now, what we've done here is uh, to look a little more uh, in detail into how the phase transition is traversed here. Uh, so now we are just going in and out, uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, the kind of uh, uh, observations uh, uh, that, you, that, that you find is uh, shown here. Uh, the blue curve is uh, the going in curve. Uh, you see uh, that uh, here we are crossing uh, the equilibrium uh, phase transition uh, boundary here, uh, going much further in uh, before the system uh, then sort of realizes, uh, oh, uh, I'm deep in the Dicke phase, I have to adjust, and here it does that. On the way back, uh, it's different. Uh, you see uh, smoothly uh, the system goes back uh, into, the, into the normal phase. If you want. And these are momentum uh, uh, pictures. Uh, along this trajectory. Uh, so you see at point A, uh, when we are long uh, behind uh, the uh, Dicke equilibrium phase transition, uh, this is an A, uh, we still have just the BC uh, and uh, the momentum peaks are coming up on the applied uh, standing wave. Uh, and on the way back, uh, you see uh, that eventually uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate that we started with at E 
is uh, um, sort of uh, regained here uh, with a few excitations on top. Uh, this is not quite the Bose condensate that we started with. You see there are some <coughs> phase fluctuations. Okay, so what we can do and have done is uh, to uh, calculate uh, such experimental traces uh, by, uh, well, uh, a mean field model, uh, basically using Carl, Carl equations. Um, <coughs> and uh, by doing that, uh, we can uh, sort of, uh, calculate uh, uh, these two points. Uh, uh, this point uh, where uh, the system comes back down uh, to the normal phase, and this point uh, where the uh, system uh, adjusts uh, uh, to the <coughs> well, to the decay phase, and uh, now uh, you can cross the phase boundary with different <coughs> speed, uh, and uh, you can plot uh, these uh, 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 values of the pump lattice depth, so these critical values, against the speed of uh, <coughs> of your quench, and. Uh, well, what we've done here uh, is uh, to do that uh, with the calculation first. Uh, so using uh, these calculations uh, uh, that uh, are matched uh, to the observations, uh, then uh, take out from the calculation uh, these uh, specific values uh, of the pump strengths, uh, and then look at how what the calculation predicts uh, with respect to uh, its dependence on the quench time. And you see uh, that. And there's a power law uh, behavior uh, uh, with respect to the quench time. And from that, uh, these kind of uh, calculations, uh, we get the exponents of this power law, and then we simply plot uh, these uh, exponents uh, into our data. And we see uh, that it fits uh, kind of OK. Uh, uh, it's not so OK uh, anymore uh, on the way out, uh, because here we're starting to lose atoms. And uh, the agreement is not so good anymore. And from that, and I want to be fairly short on, on that because my time is probably running. Um, actually, I should take a look. Um, yes, my time is running. Uh, uh, um, so I want to be very short on that. Uh, this can be used uh, to discuss uh, this in terms of a killer zero scenario and uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the exponents uh, uh, that we extracted here. Uh, one of the Kibazuic exponents uh, can be extracted. <clears throat> and at the end, uh, uh, that's the outcome uh, 0.75 on that side of the phase transition uh, in the normal phase and uh, 0.18 uh, on the other side. Uh, so they're different, <coughs> these exponents, uh, depending on which side of the phase transition you are. Um, <clears throat> very briefly, I want to show you uh, that uh, in the self organizer lattice, uh, you can look at Bloch oscillations. Uh, since we have been looking at Bloch oscillations in the Actually, a couple of lattice, uh, it's not um, too far-fetched uh, to see uh, whether this can be done in <coughs> self-organized lattice as well. And uh, this just shows you, yes, it can be done, but uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, decoherence and heating, uh, unfortunately, uh, if we do that in, in the, in the self-organized lattice. So what you see here is basically uh, <coughs> that uh, we start uh, with a BC uh, in uh, the decay phase. Uh, and then uh, apply a force uh, uh, via some magnetic gradient, uh, and you see how uh, yeah, uh, at the BC at the gamma point is now uh, doing a Bloch oscillation here. These are the higher order Bragg peaks, and this is exactly what's seen in, in the data. Uh, finally, how much time actually do I really have? Is anybody contr controlling my time? One minute, uh, okay. So um, I have to, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I have to be uh, quick. Uh, um, we can also apply uh, an external lattice uh, in addition uh, to the self-organized lattice, uh, uh, such that uh, once uh, the, self, uh, the lattice uh, in the cavity self-organizes, uh, 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 the outcome is a 3D lattice, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, deep enough uh, such that a mod insulator arises. And this is shown here. Uh, so uh, we've been going uh, at several detunings uh, into the decay phase, uh, <clears throat> uh, and we've seen uh, that at certain points uh, the uh, coherence uh, very rapidly uh, drops. Uh, uh, when we go out again, now uh, we can basically re recover uh, the BC. This is seen in one example. Uh, this is uh, this curve here. <clears throat> You see what happens here. Uh, here we cross the decay phase transition. Uh, light emerges uh, in 
cavity. However, the coherence uh, is uh, very nicely preserved, uh, only at a later instance uh, here at this point along this trajectory, all of a sudden uh, you see uh, that the coherence uh, uh, disappears. Uh, and if you go out again, uh, you see the coherence reappears first, uh, and then uh, you, uh, you leave your decay phase. And that lets you uh, <coughs> plot uh, this line, uh, telling you uh, that across the line uh, here, uh, you're in self-organized mod insulator, and here uh, you have uh, superfluidity. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so now I have one transparency left. This is, um, so I, I make it in, in half a minute. Um, and so now the question arises, uh, how about uh, uh, crossing from bidirectional to unidirectional pumping? So uh, going from this situation here uh, to this situation, how do these two worlds uh, connect? And uh, I'm showing you uh, what happens here. Uh, this <coughs> is starting uh, with the conventional uh, uh, bidirectional pumping. And you see, uh, as you weaken uh, one of the beams, uh, uh, <coughs> the area where the decay phase uh, exists, uh, where the lattice, uh, stationary lattice uh, arises in the cavity, uh, sort of uh, it moves uh, up. Uh, so at the end, uh, if there's nearly no beam from one side, uh, there's still a little bit of an island uh, where there's a decay phase. And uh, what I find uh, particularly interesting uh, is uh, that uh, you see there's a minimum detuning, a minimum negative detuning that you need uh, for a decay phase uh, to arise at all. Uh, the calculations show that, uh, but I don't have an intuitive, uh, unfortunately, an intuitive uh, explanation uh, for that and what this minimum detuning uh, really is. Okay, so then I'm at the end. Uh, um, well, uh, I was asked uh, to say something about the future. Uh, 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 that's hard, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, <coughs> what I think uh, for the future is, is most uh, sort of um, attractive, uh, uh, but that, that's a personal view, is uh, to explore the true quantum regime. Uh, all this physics uh, is a partner from the mod insulator, uh, if you want, uh, but most of that physics is uh, not really quantum physics, it's wave mechanics, uh, if you want. Uh, it's interesting, uh, but it's not uh, the kind of uh, full uh, quantum regime uh, that you could dream of uh, accessing uh, with these systems. Uh, <coughs> so, um, yeah, that's something uh, we want to do now, and uh, uh, we are already uh, in, in, in deep trouble. Uh, uh, and, uh, I don't have any results on that to show. Um, it's it's uh, much harder uh, than what we've done so far. So uh, first, uh, we are now into strong coupling uh, for much fewer atoms, uh, uh, not 100,000 or 50,000, uh, but 40 or 50 atoms. Uh, and uh, then we want to study entanglement between the light and the motion states of the BEC. Uh, uh, and, uh, one dream would be uh, to bring the cavity to a regime uh, where you can really monitor uh, particle number fluctuations in, uh, in the cavity transmission. Uh, this is something that Igor has mentioned. Uh, there's, a, there's an old suggestion uh, by Henrik Rich and, uh, and, and, and Igor uh, in that direction. Uh, <coughs> look for squeezing maybe in the transmitted light. Uh, There's also something uh, that Igor uh, has proposed uh, that one could do. Uh, or, uh, pumping uh, the sy these systems uh, with quantum light sources. Uh, what about uh, pumping uh, the system uh, with a squeezed uh, beam? Uh, that, that could be in uh, interesting. Uh, and since we have now the world champion of squeezing, uh, Roman Schnabel, uh, in our institute, uh, he has already promised uh, to make a squeezed source for us. OK, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, uh, summary is not necessary. Uh, it's the same as my uh, introduction. And uh, well. That's that's it from my side. Thanks. Thanks. Um, for the first experiment that you showed on cavity cooling, um, I was wondering what would happen. Or did you maybe try it sometimes with a thermal cloud, and then possibly even like travel pulses that would narrow down the momentum distribution in one direction? Yeah, we have obviously uh, uh, try to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that doesn't work well uh, in our experiment. Uh, 
Well, in our experiment, uh, there's a few drawbacks uh, for these kind of things. Uh, one is uh, the uh, exceptionally high density that we have. Uh, we have squeezed uh, our BC in a uh, fairly elongated cigar uh, to have it nicely in the mold. Uh, so uh, the radius is three microns, uh, and we have uh, uh, on, on around four times 10 to 14 atoms per uh, uh, centimeter cube. Uh, we need uh, the atoms to, to be strongly coupled. Uh, so we cannot say, okay, uh, let's go down to a uh, factor 10 less atoms, uh, then we cannot work, uh, not, not in a strong coupling regime. So uh, <coughs> that's uh, something uh, that uh, uh, makes these kind of things uh, a lot more difficult. <coughs> but you see a little bit of, uh, you know, you can push things a little bit together, uh, but it's not fantastic. Uh, we've not even published it because it's would not be, well, but if I'd see that data or somebody else published that, I'd say, this you cannot use on But uh, if one, in principle, one could uh, definitely, well, change things uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our apparatus and, uh, and demonstrate that. Okay, I'll ask the question. So in the, uh, in the data on block <coughs> oscillations, I, I can buy the idea that the block oscillation frequency is independent of what's going on. Uh, but of course, the signal ought to be distorted, I, partly because of retardation, partly because of, anyhow, can you explain like the, the actual you know, non-sinusoidal block oscillation uh, signal coming out of the cavity? Yes. Um... Um, yeah, there is, well, we've looked at the uh, FFTs of uh, uh, the oscillation and see uh, that there's, there's higher harmonics. Uh, uh, but uh, even without the cavity, uh, uh, you expect that to happen uh, if you have a shallow lattice uh, versus a deep lattice. Uh, like in a shallow lattice, uh, uh, you have higher order uh, contributions uh, from the fact that your block oscillation is basically, uh, mostly uh, you have kind of a... Uh, <coughs> A linear acceleration and then a very uh, instantaneous Bragg scattering process. Uh, so you have these kind of ramp like, like uh, <coughs> like if you uh, look at the conventional uh, signal uh, from Bach oscillation, uh, <coughs> then. Um, well, this is uh, not a symmetric signal. Uh, well, the, here the way it's um, the way the analysis is made here, uh, uh, it's it's uh, the ramp is here basically infinitely steep uh, because we have yeah. just uh, yeah. uh, taken the maximum yeah. of uh, the. But you can you can take the average uh, and then uh, you still end up uh, with a yeah. asymmetric uh, signal depending on uh, the depth of your lattice. Uh. Right, but I, but I see also the Bragg signal you get is, is pretty asynchronous to the. Uh, Oh yeah, there's yeah, there's 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 a phase delay. That phase delay is uh, re reflecting uh, the delay we have in the system. Yeah, that's that's exactly uh, uh, where you see uh, that uh, yeah, the matter uh, variables uh, they don't follow uh, the law uh, <coughs> instantaneously. And there's that that has been cut. We have uh, Prasanna Bagatash has made calculations yeah. uh, that that show that. Uh, they kind of reproduce this uh, waveform. Yeah, they kind of reproduce that. I mean, this is not uh, the kind of reproduction uh, where you want to put one curve across the other, right? Yes. But uh, the features uh, you see. I have only uh, very few data here. Like, this is, you see, uh, this, this is uh, experimental data for different detunings, blue detuning and red detuning. You see uh, that uh, for blue detuning and red detuning, according to the explanation here, uh, you are 180 degree out of phase uh, with the oscillations, uh, because uh, here uh, for the red curve, uh, you sit uh, uh, here with your pump laser, uh, and you see uh, that uh, uh, the motion of your uh, uh, the cavity profile is out of phase of 180 degree, uh, as compared to the case when you sit here. Right? And this is the calculation uh, uh, along with that. And you also see here uh, that uh, you see that high harmonics are uh, getting important here. Uh, and you can sort of 
well, dream uh, that this is not completely uh, <coughs> I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, it's always fun to be back in the old stomping grounds. Um, this conference has really been uh, sort of a unique pleasure. Uh, I was chatting with Ben about this earlier. It's rare that you go to a poster session and everybody has cavities. <laughs> so, uh, so, so anyway, uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you... Uh, primarily about work uh, going on in my group, building topological matter from light, um, uh, and also uh, a little bit about some collaborations with Dave, uh, sort of the complementary piece to, uh, to what he told you about yesterday. Um, but I thought I'd sort of front load uh, with the uh, vision, because uh, if we're being realistic, I won't get to it at the end. Um, so, uh, I think one thing we've really taken away from this workshop so far is that uh, many body cavity QED means many different things to many different people. Um, I think one neat avenue, uh, and one that I'm pushing on, is uh, making photonic analogs of condensed matter models, right? I don't think this is the, uh, the only paradigm where one can explore uh, interesting physics in sort of a many body strongly correlated context, but that's the one that we're, uh, we're, we're focused on uh, in my group. Um, and, and I think to some extent, one can really just ask questions about these condensed matter models in general, but I think there's also a lot to learn uh, from the implementation process with, uh, with light as opposed to implementing with cold atoms or in a solid state. Uh, and, uh, and, and also uh, from the unique properties that we get from the photonic implementations. Um, so I'm going to try something kind of new today, uh, which is uh, I, I always give this talk about, let's talk about making the ingredients for fractional quantum Hall states. Uh, and, and I realized that probably at least in the, in the cavity QED community, Many people probably don't know what, it, what a fractional quantum Hall state is. Um, I know I don't. Um, but, uh, but so what I thought I'd do is uh, uh, start with a, a quantum optometrist uh, view uh, of, of what a fractional quantum Hall state is and, and, uh, and use that as kind of a, uh, a leaping off point uh, for the remainder of the story. Um, so just by way of background, you know, the game in general that, uh, that, that, that I'm focused on is you have some solid state model where you have electrons whose properties come from some lattice of ions. Uh, when I say properties, I mean their dispersion, the behaviors of the individual particles. 
okay? Um, and then entanglement and richness comes from the interactions of these electrons. So the uh, condensed matter with ultra-cold atoms paradigm is to explore this kind of physics um, where the properties of atoms are determined either by lattices or other sorts of laser beams. Uh, and the richness comes from the interactions between the atoms. Uh, and so, you know, I think some of the story of this community is to say, let's control the properties of photons with some sort of metamaterials, right? Uh, be they circuits or microwave resonator arrays, or in our case, multimode optical resonators, and then use sort of very modern quantum optics tools to allow the photons to interact with one another. Um, so um, with, with that kind of a backdrop that we need to engineer the single particle physics, and then we need to engineer the interactions between the particles, uh, let's take a step back and talk about uh, uh, electrons initially in magnetic fields. Um, so, so this is kind of the, the Hamiltonian for an electron in a magnetic field, um, either classically or quantum mechanically. Um, and what we know is that uh, this electron just goes in a little cyclotron orbit. So here the magnetic field either points into or out of the page, uh, whichever one makes it go around in that direction. Uh, I can never remember which one's my right hand. So um, we'll leave it at that. Um, so, but we would really like to understand the quantum mechanical version of this ultimately, but I don't want to diagonalize Hamiltonians with you guys, so let's see what we can get just sort of from intuition here. The statement is, if I translate this electron over a little bit in space, I get the same kind of behavior kind of wherever I put the system, right? Uh, so there's some kind of translational invariance going on, and we also know that as I speed up the electron, Right, uh, the speed of this orbit doesn't change. Right, its size changes, but its speed doesn't change. Um, and so, what we can kind of take away from this is that there's some sort of translational invariance, and also this system has discrete energy levels in a quantum mechanical context. Um, by that I mean I have to make up localized wave packets that move in space, but because everything is moving at this cyclotron frequency omega c. What I'm really going to have is, is some kind of discrete energy levels separated by omega c, and at each of these energy levels, I'm going to have a bunch of eigenstates. Okay? Now, the statement is that these eigenstates uh, are, are within these energy levels, are called, these are called Landau levels. Okay? Um, and today we're going to focus on this lowest Landau level. So remember, we could make orbitals of different sizes. If you try to do this in quantum mechanics, Within this lowest Landau level, you can make sort of a minimum uncertainty wave packet, and then you can make wave packets with quantized uh, angular momentum and units of h bar. Okay, uh, and so the message you should take away here is, if you like math, this is this symmetric gauge uh, representation of the lowest Landau level wave functions, um, and and the only thing that's important is that I can write it in terms of this complex coordinate z. So if you just replace z with x plus i, y, these, these wave functions uh, are, are those objects, and everything works out. But it turns out writing it in terms of this z is going to be useful when we add interactions into the story. OK? So far, so good? Presumably, everyone's seen a little bit of this in quantum mechanics? Good. OK. So uh, what happens when we add interactions between the particles? Well, I want these interactions to be sort of central. That is to say, they should be along the axis between the particles. Um, that's rule number one. And rule number two is I'd like them to be, in some sense, local in space. So that is to say, as the particles move apart, uh, the interaction energy goes to zero. Uh, so they can be attractive or repulsive. Of course, typically in a solid, they're repulsive. Um, now, what I really wanted to do here was give you guys a classical animation uh, of cyclotron orbiting electrons bouncing off of each other. Uh, that turns out to be harder than I expected. <laughs> so, so I have a lot of uh, badly diverging uh, numerical simulations of this produced at 4 a.m., and I just decided maybe it'd be better to skip that. 
Um, so the story is the dynamics are kind of messy classically, but you can imagine situations where you get crystals with the electrons kind of going in little circles together in a classical paradigm. But, but what happens quantum mechanically? Well, now you can kind of create field operators for your particles if you want to work in a second quantized notation. Um, and you can say, each one of the particles that I can create has this uh, single particle Hamiltonian, which gave me those Landau levels. And then I also have contact interactions. Okay? So for people who come from the optical lattice side, this is a familiar picture. For those who come from the, uh, the cavity side, it's maybe a little less familiar. But uh, what I'd like to do is say, if we first diagonalize this part, we get all of these eigenstates in the Landau levels. And I just want to think about interactions that are weak compared to the spacing between the Landau levels. Okay? So you might say, doesn't that mean we're in a weakly interacting limit? Well, no, because remember, all of these eigenstates are at exactly the same energy, right? And so, in fact, if I have any non-zero interaction, as long as it's larger than the, the, the one over the lifetime of my particles and the disorder and yada, yada, yada. Okay, so it does need to be a fairly large interaction in practice, right? But if I have any interaction in theory, it will determine the ordering of particles within this Landau level, right? Because there's no other energy scale in the problem. So the question is, if I have particles living in these angular momentum eigenstates, if I have a bunch of them, what does this term do to those particles? So the, the, oops, that was disappointing. It gave it away. So if I have a pair of particles, one and L equals one and L equals one and L equals four, the statement is if you just look at what this interaction does within the lowest Landau level, well, it allows the particles to exchange angular momentum between them. Um, and move to new pairs of states, okay? And how rapidly this happens depends upon which pair of states they started in and which pair of states they're ending up in. But you can see that this is going to get very messy very quickly if you have many particles uh, in this system, okay? Uh, so we've got this Hamiltonian, and then what I want to ask is what is the ground state in the presence of that sort of short-range contact interaction between the particles. Well, it turns out Laughlin got a Nobel Prize for writing this down. Um, and in part, it's because it's extremely simple. Um, and uh, OK, but the problem is that you don't have the wave functions anymore. Uh, so, so these things don't commute. There's, there's a problem from Monica's talk now, which is, you need the wave functions from several slides back, um, but I'm not going to go back to them. I'd just like you to remember that those wave functions were powers of the complex coordinate, right? That's all they were. So the statement is, if I have a bunch of electrons labeled by their index i, z1, z2, z3, I can write the wave function of all of the electrons like this. Now, why is this a good way to write it? Well, it's a good way to write it because this is manifestly all particles within the lowest Landau level. Is that clear? Basically, if you expand this out, okay, every zi is going to be raised to some power in each of the terms, right? And then it will be multiplied by this Gaussian factor. And that's exactly the form of the lowest Landau level wave functions, right? So this is explicitly within the lowest Landau level, so that's good. And there's no contact interaction. How can we tell there's no contact interaction? Well, because if zi is ever equal to zj, the wave function has a second order zero. Yes? And so this is a really cool thing. This is a situation where we can write down an exact solution to actually a, a pretty strongly correlated uh, kind of a problem. So in, in the solid state, there are all sorts of interesting signatures of this from things like uh, fractional Hall conductivity, which is very well quantized, uh, to evidence of fractional charge. And indeed, uh, excitations on top of this ground state that have fractional statistics, meaning when you braid them around each other, 
or swap their places, the wave function doesn't get a minus sign or a plus sign. It can get a phase, or it can actually get uh, a unitary, as though you're performing a, a quantum gate. Okay? Um, I don't want to go into that, because this is supposed to be at least partially an experimental talk. But I felt like, particularly in the context of this conference, it's quite nice to, uh, to, to, to see this, because I think it, when, when we talk at the end about uh, this kind of game of how we actually use quantum optics tools to build these states, um, you get some intuition for what this kind of crazy looking wave function really means. Okay, um, so now we can ask, uh, if we want to explore this physics with photons, what do we need? Well, you can see we're going to need two ingredients, right? Ingredient number one is we're going to need photons that behave as though they're in a magnetic field. And ingredient number two is we're going to need some way to uh, engineer a local interaction between photons. That is to say, if they're with, in the same location to, to an even smaller length scale than, uh, oops, then, oh boy. Um, okay. Uh, even smaller length scale than the size of the modes, there's some energy costs associated with that. So, so we need to figure out how to kind of make these two ingredients. And to me, part of what's really beautiful about photons is that there's a tremendous amount of headroom because they move so fast to engineer kind of whatever single particle dynamics you want, right? Um, and, and then, you know, the game is how to get these interactions. And so what I'm hoping to do in the uh, remaining, now it's I guess probably an hour and 20 minutes, is, uh, no seriously guys, you're going to be here a long time, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, is uh, kind of give you a flavor of how that goes. Okay. Um, so when you build materials from cold atoms, you can either think of lattice physics or kind of bulk physics. Um, so Dave has told you uh, about our collaborative effort using basically his tools to uh, explore this physics in lattices. Right? We make these uh, transmon qubit arrays to engineer the interactions. Um, and uh, then we make these uh, 3D micro microwave cavity arrays to engineer uh, synthetic magnetic fields. Um, and so uh, there we've got you know, mod insulators with ever-improving fidelity, and we can measure band structures for these uh, lattices and edge states and chiral dynamics and all that good stuff. And so the game on this side is to put those tools together. Uh, what I'd like to really share in the remaining time today is how to do this uh, in the bulk gas limit, where that wave function that I wrote down for you is really the nearly exact solution uh, for, uh, for, for optical photons. Okay, um, so the game is that we can use multi-mode non-planar optical resonators to make these Landau levels for light, and we can use uh, Rydberg atoms, uh, basically uh, distributed in the cross-section of the cavity to uh, mediate interactions between the photons. And then, uh, time permitting, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the ideas that we have and that we're developing with folks like uh, Siobhan and, uh, and Eric uh, to build Laughlin states. Uh, when we combine those tools. So, the basic model here that, that we're harnessing is that uh, a photon in a multimode cavity behaves like a massive particle in a harmonic trap. So, this is a real space analogy, not a Fox space analogy. I'm talking about a harmonic trap in space, not a harmonic trap in particle number. Okay? Uh, and so, what you should really think for now is that if I have a photon and I raise, apply this raising operator to it, I'm not putting more photons into the system. I'm changing its spatial wave function to, uh, to put it into higher and higher harmonic oscillator states. Okay? So the story then is uh, just if you want to think from a totally classical perspective, and here when I say classical and quantum mechanical, what I really mean is particle and wave, not anything about entanglement like before. Um, if we send light in off axis, the claim is that it bounces back and forth between these two cavity mirrors, both longitudinally 
and, and it also kind of oscillates back and forth laterally. Okay, so these are these ideas that Martin Weitz has employed to make photon BECs, but uh, because we're going to also have to kind of extend them to make gauge fields, I'd like to, to really beat on this a little bit. So the statement is if I ray trace and watch a, a photon move back and forth through the cavity, what you can kind of see is that the curvature of the mirrors prevents the photon from kind of bouncing off to infinity. It, it acts as a, as a transverse trap for the light. Okay? Um, and uh, if we want to think in a, uh, a wave picture, or what one might call a quantum mechanical picture now, what we know is that the transverse modes of a Fabry-Perot cavity are Hermite Gauss, and they're uniformly spaced in energy. That's the same as the modes of a quantum harmonic oscillator, right? Hermite Gauss and uniformly spaced in energy. And so what this means is if we think about a single longitudinal quantum number of our cavity, okay, um, there is a really nice mapping, even formally, between uh, the modes of the cavity and the, and the modes of a mass on a spring. Okay? Um, and so, just to really uh, hammer this home, if I put a photon into the cavity translated laterally, kind of off-center, away from the cavity axis, I can write it state as a superposition of the lowest mode of the cavity and this first excited transverse mode. So this is like a TEM00 and this is a TEM10. Okay, and those two will constructively interfere on the right side and destructively interfere on the left side. But there's some frequency difference between them arising from a GUI phase. Um, and uh, half a cycle later of that frequency difference, this plus sign becomes a minus sign, and now the photon is shifted off to the left of the cavity axis. Right? So this, in some sense, is stuff that you know from quantum mechanics. right? And when I say it in this way, it's probably also obvious for cavity photons, but I think people often don't think of cavity photons in, in kind of this way. And the, and the statement is, within a manifold of, of, a, a, of a fixed longitudinal mode in all of those transverse modes, you really have a massive particle in a harmonic trap. So you should think of the photons. These are slightly more artistically rendered mirrors. Um, okay, And the photon is delocalized longitudinally, right? Because as I said, a fixed longitudinal quantum number, and uh, oscillating back and forth transversely. OK? Great. Um, so there's a whole flow K story if you want to understand that formally. But, but the sort of takeaway message is that the free space propagation along the cavity axis kind of gives your photons an effective mass. And the curvature of your mirrors provides some trapping. So the question is, is there a way to uh, add on top of this a uh, magnetic field for the light. Um, and what I'd like to argue here is that the answer is actually yes. Okay, and that's resonator twist. Now in a two mirror cavity, resonator twist is not a thing, right? You can turn your mirrors all, all you want and nothing happens. But if instead we take a four mirror cavity, um, and, and th then, uh, then you can twist. And the way you should think about this twist is kind of as a, like a periscope. So I have my two mirrors of my periscope here, and I'm looking at a tree uh, through the periscope. Okay? The image comes out vertical. Okay? But if I rotate the lower mirror by 90 degrees, the image comes out rotated. Okay? And so the statement is kind of that the rotation of the top mirror relative to the bottom mirror produces an image rotation. And uh, if we just take these two mirrors and add two more to kind of close the thing into a cavity, that's the kind of setup that we have in mind. All right? Um, and so the, uh, the basic game is that then on every round trip through your cavity, your image gets rotated a little bit. A little bit and the Hermite Gauss modes that we're comfortable with can no longer be the eigenmodes of the cavity. OK? Um, so. Uh, we can understand what the eigenmodes must be, though, uh, mathematically, and we'll do that next. But let's just take a quick moment to think about life in a rotating frame, because that's what we're talking about here, right? We have our particle, which is massive and it's harmonically trapped, but every kind of time step, it rotates. The system looks like it rotates a little bit due to this cavity twist, okay? And that really turns the lab frame into a rotating frame, 
And uh, the question is, what does that do to the dynamics? Well, you learned this in high school, probably. Middle school for the Russians. And um, it, it adds what are normally fictitious forces. In our case, they're real forces. It adds a Coriolis force and a centrifugal force. Well, we can compensate this centrifugal force with just mirror curvature. And this Coriolis force, omega cross P, looks an awful lot like V cross B. Right? And so the statement is, this is really going to give us Landau levels for light when we cancel out this centrifugal force. Okay? Um, so, so how does this go in practice? If you have a planar cavity, you can think of a photon trapped in this cavity as, uh, as having this kind of harmonic oscillator spectrum where you can have excitations along either x or y. Okay? Uh, and as I twist it, and I'm going to show you that shortly, these eigenmodes have to mix into uh, uh, Laguerre-Gauss modes, basically. Uh, superpositions of, the, of these two, that are this one plus i times that one, and this one minus i times that one. And when the phase winds in the same direction as the twist, the energy goes down. And when the phase winds in the opposite direction from the twist, the energy goes up. Okay? And so as I twist, what you can see is we get these ring modes, which maybe looked familiar from that Landau level story earlier, right? And uh, we can basically make them degenerate by twisting the cavity. Okay? Um, now, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to hop ahead a little bit because there's a whole story about curved space here, but it's not terribly important um, for what we're interested in today. Um, what's important for us is that we can make one of these cavities. It's just four super polished mirrors. And we, instead of adjusting the mirror curvature, we adjust the length a little bit. And that adjusts the twist. And that allows us to go to this point where the, uh, the twist exactly compensates the curvature of the mirrors and gives us Landau levels for light. Okay? And so this is just sort of doing a mode spectroscopy of this cavity as we approach degeneracy. And we can make 10 modes degenerate to a megahertz or better. Okay? And that's a, sort of an important number because rydberg rydberg interactions on the length scales of a typical cavity mode, which is 10 or 20 microns, tend to be on the order of megahertz. And so that means that our interactions are going to be larger than the disorder that comes from this cavity, and we should be able to hybridize the modes uh, to make Laughlin states. Um, so, um, I think, let's see, in all seriousness, I have to be done by 35 to leave 10 minutes for talking. Is that correct? Is that the game? Yeah, aim for it. That's what I should aim for? That, that sounded pretty uh, non-committal there, yeah. How much time do I really have? An hour? <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, yeah. More than 40 minutes. What? An hour minus 20 minutes. I see what you did there. Okay, um, so, so we can really tune to this, uh, this degeneracy point, and the cavity modes are, are quite degenerate. They get a little bit distorted, uh, we think either due to, to, to mirror, curve, uh, mirror imperfections or uh, some higher order aberrations in the, in the mirror surface, but we can maintain a finesse above like 8 or 10,000, so that's, that's good enough uh, for the physics I'm going to talk about moving forward. Um, now, so I will, I will skip this whole story about um, curved space, as I said, and talk about interactions. And, and here's the thing that's interesting. You say 8 or 10,000, how can you possibly get into a strongly interacting regime of photons, right? If you're talking about cavities with a waste of 10 or 12 microns, right, and a finesse of 10,000, right? And here, when I say strong interactions, remember, our photons have to collide multiple times within their lifetimes in the cavity, right? Uh, and so we really need interactions which are strong compared to kappa, right? Many times kappa. Uh, and so the, the game is that um, we need interactions which are large compared to the bandwidth of this manifold of modes, which is a couple megahertz, small compared to the energy spacing uh, to the next longitudinal manifold, right, which we want to ignore, which is a couple of gigahertz, but that'll be no problem. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that, that, yeah, don't, don't worry about that. Um, uh, and, and they need to be large compared to this 
kind of megahertz energy scale, um, when the photons are within kind of a magnetic length or, or kind of the size of a mode of this cavity. Okay? Um, and remember, we can only think of the physics as kind of living in this central plane because the light is sort of continuously refocused by the, uh, by the cavity mirrors. So this is kind of a bizarre thing. If you look over here, this is momentum space or almost momentum space for the light. So if you put a medium th that mediated interactions over here, you would have like momentum space interactions. And if you put the medium here, you get real space interactions, right? And so what you don't want is a medium everywhere, right? Because then you have some kind of weird hybrid of real space and momentum. I mean, maybe you do want that. But for this, I mean, I think that's actually, it's an interesting question, right, for this community. We can make models that basically have no analog whatsoever. I mean, look at this stuff that, that, that well, maybe they do have analogs, but they're crazy analogs, right, that Ben stuff. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, embracing that is maybe a good thing, but a piece of the game is that we can, we, we have the freedom to, to go either way. Uh, and, and here we want the interactions to be local. So we need to put some medium here which enables the photons to collide with each other in real space. Um, and uh, to understand the medium that we're putting in, uh, we should think about what happens uh, when light goes into any medium. Okay? The basic understanding that you should have is that why does light slow down when it goes through a piece of glass? Well, light always moves at the speed of light when it's light. right? But when it's been absorbed by an atom, it doesn't move at all. And so, the index of refraction is sort of uh, a reflection of the fact that your photon is spending some time as an atomic excitation as it moves through the window. Yeah? So the game here is to create a situation where when the first photon goes into the medium, it excites an electron up to, say, a very highly excited state. In our case, we're going to go to n equals 100. Okay? And what that will do is... Uh, basically create an electronic orbital in here which is many or in the neighborhood of a wavelength across. Okay? And so what that means is when a second photon tries to go in and get absorbed by those atoms, the atoms can't absorb it because of the interactions between the electrons. Yes? So if the second photon gets near the first photon, this object looks transparent. Right? And that's sort of how you can think about Rydberg EIT. The first photon creates a spatially varying index of refraction for the second photon, and the second photon can then lens off of that. Okay? And uh, in, the, in the appropriate language, that's really a collision between your photons. So, so this idea was pioneered by Misha and Vlad uh, in, uh, in this pretty cool paper. Actually, it's a very cool paper. Let's not undersell it. Um, we are in Cambridge, after all. Um, so, uh, and, and so what we're trying to do is take these ideas and move them into a multi-mode regime, um, multiple transverse modes, and also into a cavity, because we've got this great setup where we have magnetic fields for light. And so all we need to do is combine that with these interactions. Okay? Uh, and so what you should then think of is your photons are moving back and forth transversely, right? and you create a superposition of a, a cavity photon and an atomic excitation that kind of follows it around. Okay? And, and for the experts, um, we get a, a collective enhancement in the interaction between the, uh, between the photons. Uh, we don't have to think about the single particle cooperativity. We can really use the n particle cooperativity because uh, all n of these atoms, which have sort of changed color, can only be excited once in total due to this Rydberg interaction between the atoms, right? So these n atoms that are moving around together really sort of effectively act like one atom, okay? Um, so in practice, what we do is we build a four-mirror cavity like this. Uh, the separation between these two mirrors is about two centimeters. Uh, these two mirrors are actually convex, and this is a, a cool geometry because even though these mirrors are two centimeters apart, we get a waste of about 11 microns in between them. Okay? You can think of this as kind of a tie sap kind of a cavity. We take a mott, we uh, load it into a dipole trap, which we convert into a lattice, 
and transport the atoms up into the cavity. So now we've got a cloud which is about 100 microns long, which is large compared to this kind of blockade length scale. And so what I'm plotting here is uh, the cavity mode uh, as it propagates through the atoms. And what we need to do is uh, use some kind of super resolution technique, which uh, if you want to chat about, we can talk about later, to slice this cloud down until it's about 10 microns thick. Okay? Um, and now we can perform Rydberg EIT experiments. Uh, and, well, okay, so first we can see the atoms move through the cavity. That's all very nice. But uh, if we add a beam that dresses up to this Rydberg state, we not only get a vacuum Rabi splitting, but we also get this electromagnetically induced transparency window uh, in the middle, uh, where when photons go in here, this window is very narrow, which kind of reflects that the photon spends a lot of time as a Rydberg excitation uh, in the atomic gas. Okay? Um, so uh, we typically get a ground Rydberg coherence. Uh, now we're down to about 50 kilohertz. Um, and uh, the, remember the interaction energy scale between these Rydbergs is about 10 megahertz uh, on the length scales that we're talking about. Um, and so this is uh, kind of the latest and greatest cavity here. It turns out you need to keep the mirrors very far from the Rydbergs uh, because Rydbergs hate everything. Uh, you know, you want things that are extremely sensitive to electric fields, but uh, you can see the chemistry of things getting adsorbed onto the surface at a few millimeters away, uh, just because you know, a few millivolts per centimeter field is enough to make your Rydbergs very unhappy. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, Nathan Shine actually worked extremely hard on this. This is also the guy who did the, the twisted cavities. So compared to the twisted cavity, this was actually very easy for him. Um, now he's trying to make a twisted version of this, and that's not so easy. But, uh, but, but, but anyway, um, when you uh, uh, look at this, the, this is now looking at Rydberg EIT to this 100S state. Um, and what you can see is that you should be able to put one photon into this cavity. But if you try to put a second one in, it'll reflect off. Um, and once that second one leaves, or the first one leaves, you should now be able to put another one in. And this should be reflected in a, in a power dependence of your, of your transmission. As we increase the probe power, the transmission drops. Okay? And uh, that should then be reflected if it's really a single photon nonlinearity in a suppression of the G2, uh, which, which we actually see here quite nicely. Um, and in fact, we can, we can even drive uh, or start to drive Rabi oscillations on this uh, dark polariton resonance. So basically the system, Rabi oscillates one polariton into the cavity and back out and so forth. Uh, and the, this dark polariton number really saturates at one half at, at high drive powers, uh, which, which is evidence that this is really effectively a two-level system here. So this is the kind of single transverse mode version of this story. Um, and the game moving forward is to uh, apply these ideas in a, uh, in a multiple transverse mode uh, paradigm to make Laughlin states. And so what I thought I'd do with the last uh, couple of minutes is uh, kind of try to give you a flavor of uh, how we will combine these magnetic fields with photon-photon scattering uh, to build uh, what I call here uh, optimistically topological many-body states. Maybe you call them topological few-body states. People call them uh, Laughlin states. We call them Laughlin droplets. Um, because it will not be a huge number of particles, but I think we can kind of get some neat intuition uh, from the way that this works. So the experiment that I just described to you says if you have uh, interactions between your photons in real space and you inject into the L equals zero mode of this cavity, you should be able to put one photon in, but you won't be able to put a second photon in, right, because of uh, this, this photon-photon interaction. So the second one will reflect off, right? Um, and, and I showed you data for that. But, so now here's the question. What if I inject into the L equals 1 mode of this cavity? Well, you would say the photon-photon interaction should still prevent me from putting two photons into the system, right? But remember this uh, squeezing rule I told you about earlier, right? The interactions conserve angular momentum, right? So. If there's no angular momentum state in the Landau level below L equals zero, two photons in L equals zero can't collide and go into 
a different pair of states. But L equals 1 photons, if there are two of them, they can collide and change their angular momentum, can't they? Right? So two L equals 1 photons can collide and turn into an L equals 0 photon and an L equals 2 photon. So this is a kind of a cool thing, because now there's the, the question is, you know, we have three different states, or three different terms in this two-state two manifold to think about. There's an interaction energy cost associated with having two photons in L equals 1. There's an interaction energy cost associated with having a photon in L equals 0 and a photon in L equals 2. And then there's an interaction matrix element which couples those two states. Okay? And so the question is, what superposition of these two states has the minimum Rydberg, Rydberg interaction? Well, the answer is it's the one with a minus sign there. And uh, you can rewrite that as Z1 minus Z2 squared times this, which hopefully you remember from the beginning of the talk as the two-photon Laughlin state. Right? And so the way you can see this is that this state is superpositions of terms that look like Z1 squared times Z2 to the zero. That's one term in L equals zero, one, one photon in L equals zero, and one in L equals two. And terms that look like Z1 to the one, Z2 to the one, which is both of the photons in this state. Okay? And so what this means is you can kind of think of this system as a Laughlin state filter. As long as the state with a plus sign here has a large interaction energy, when I inject on L equals 1, two photons will come out in a superposition of L equals 1 and L equals 0 and 2. Right? They come out in the two photon Laughlin state. And indeed, the, the theory says if you do this on L equals 2, three photons will come out in the L equals 3 Laughlin state. Uh, and so on and so forth. Now, in practice, the scaling of this is not so favorable, uh, uh, basically because three photons in L equals two doesn't have a great overlap with a three photon Laughlin state. And so there's a real game of uh, what are better ways to build and stabilize uh, these sorts of states. So one idea is to harness this dissipative stabilization technique that uh, Dave talked about yesterday. Uh, for Laughlin states here, uh, and guys like uh, uh, Jacopo Carasoto uh, and uh, Mohammed Hafezi have thought along these lines. And uh, uh, another kind of possible approach to making these states is to uh, foundless pump, uh, basically put a photon in and then uh, flux thread the system. I didn't tell you about cones, so we don't, maybe we don't talk about that one. But uh, a kind of cool idea that, uh, that, that uh, Eric and Chauvin have been thinking about is if you first inject a photon in L equals 0, and then you next inject a photon in L equals 2, right, that should also have, as the only non-interacting state, the two-photon Laughlin state. Right? And then when you inject again for the next one in L equals 4, well, you're not going to end up with as photons in 0, 2, and 4. You're going to end up with photons in the 3-photon Laughlin state. But because you're kind of growing at the edge of the system, you know that the system has you know, a good overlap with, uh, with adding a particle there. And so it's, it's kind of a good way to build up uh, the many-body states, potentially. Um, but I think there are all kinds of different approaches that one can think about uh, for exploring uh, building of these states and stabilization of them, which is kind of unique to the fact that we have as many photons as we want uh, as a resource and in a way that, that can be kind of tricky uh, in a cold atom experiment. Right? Uh, so pho photons are real cheap. Although it's, I guess it's an interesting question. Are photons cheaper than atoms? Yes. Yes? Yes. No? Yes? Well, we yeah. <laughs> it's a fair point, but it, yeah. Um, so, so anyway, um, I guess with that, uh, I, I will I'll conclude. Um, I, I do want to thank my whole group um, and particularly highlight uh, these folks. Um, Alex, uh, as Dave mentioned, is uh, the real superstar leading this uh, uh, quantum circuits uh, mod insulator effort.
uh, and, and he's really fantastic. He comes from Marcus's group and in a year went from knowing nothing about quantum circuits to building a, a, an eight qubit uh, quantum simulator. Um, Nathan is the twisted cavity expert and uh, Michelle uh, worked closely with him. We have some churn number measurements for these uh, Landau levels that, that she performed. She's actually now here, Michelle, uh, working with John Doyle. So you should all say hi to her. I can wait. No? Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, John and Nathan have really been leading this uh, polariton effort, and Clay is making the gauge fields for the, for the microwave photons. So, uh, and, and, and of course, Dave's pretty great, too. And, and this is our logo. Um, so with that, I'll uh, thank them, and thank you guys for your attention. Um, so, it's an interesting question. The simple answer is you can do the calculation and the answer is that, that it doesn't. Um, is that making some approximations? Or is that always. I mean, but but it's, making, it's making good approximations. No, um, but I'm trying to think about the... the, the so the, the good way to think about this is that the laser beams are basically longitudinal, right? Uh, it, it is a piece of this story. Oh, I, actually, a better answer has to do with the recoil of the atoms, right? The energy scale associated with the atoms getting the angular momentum is very, very small, right? Uh, and, and so what that means is that will eventually happen, right? But on time scales, very long compared to these experiments. Remember, the polaritons live for at most a microsecond. So atomic motion doesn't end up being a big thing on those time scales. When we can get the polaritons living for a millisecond, then we will happily put the atoms in a 3D optical lattice. But uh, that will be the least of our worries at that point. Good question. Yeah. So this went over pretty quickly, but you said you show these nonlinearities, and then you said that Hilbert is like a tool lab, but there were very interesting dynamics going on. Yes. Um, so what are the origin? So you're saying what's this fast stuff at the beginning? So, so maybe we should talk just briefly about what we're seeing here. Without this fast thing at the beginning, you should think of this as I'm driving this, uh, this polaritonic mode, and it can absorb a photon and then be de-excited, right? And, and if this were a linear system, it would just keep absorbing and absorbing photons, right, and just reach a steady state. But because it's a nonlinear system, even when you drive it on resonance, it oscillates, which, which tells you that it can only absorb one excitation, and then it gets de-excited. So then you ask, but what is this really fast thing at the beginning? Well, the statement is, if you want to see these oscillations, you have to drive this thing hard compared to its width. right? Otherwise, the oscillations get damped out. But when you start to drive this central feature harder and harder, remember, its height is in some sense, kind of fixed. This can only absorb one photon, right? How many photons can these bright polaritons absorb? As many as you want, right? Because these correspond to excitations of the atoms to the P state rather than to a Rydberg state, right? And so what that means is that while this rapidly saturates at one excitation, this re off-resonance excitation, which at lowest order is very strongly suppressed, when you drive hard, it just continues to get bigger and bigger. And so this fast oscillation here is the off-resonant excitation of the bright polaritons. So it only shows yeah. up when you do resonant two-photon transition, but not detuned. Um, yes, so you might say, why don't we detune from the p-state? Uh, and the answer always in these experiments is that optical depth, even collective optical depth, is at a premium. So as you detune from the p-state, you either need a tremendous amount of blue power, right, or you need a tremendous optical depth, or probably both, right? Uh, and so to get the best nonlinearity, you work on atomic resonance. 
do you have to think carefully about what rebirth states you use to do this? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think this is actually a really interesting question as well. If you go to too high a Rydberg state, your interaction range is large compared to your magnetic length, and you can't think of the things as contact interactions, right? And even though you still get conservation of angular momentum, right, because it's a, 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 a central potential, you don't get the right form of the interaction such that this uh, quadratic suppression of them being close together is enough. Right? And, and so as a, as a consequence, higher Haldane pseudo-potentials come into the story. But, so, so you don't want to go too high in principal quantum number. But if you go too low in principal quantum number, your interaction becomes small compared to the lifetime of the particles. So there is kind of a, a, a sweet spot in there where you get the best, uh, the best behavior. None of this stuff is really truly universal, but it's universal over some parameter range. So, uh, if I forget about laughing states, or when I try to understand in real space what's happening when your when your photons collide um, at the conserved quantities. So, I mean, I have this first photon that gets absorbed that corresponds to some some uh, coherently distributed excitation, right? In the two example, and then they have this second photon that arrives in different spatial mode, and then what? Sorry, for the for the Laughlin state story. Okay, yes. So for the photon photon interaction and. and Oh. Of what quantities are so they're, they're, okay, for the photon-photon interaction in the multi-mode case, mm -hmm. yes? So, so there you say the first photon goes into the L equals 1 state of the cavity, and the atomic ensemble gets excited into a collective excitation which is also in the L equals 1 state, okay? Exactly. When I try to send a second photon in, it cannot just go into that L equals 1 state because then there would be a large energy cost associated with that, okay? So what happens is both photons rearrange, okay? And I end up in a situation where I have the superposition of both photons in L equals 1 or one of the photons in L equals 0 and but one of them in L equals 2. Yeah, but in reality, at that, at that stage, it's an atomic excitation. So no, there, but it's both. The so, point, so how does it redistribute? That, that, that's what I... So, so the statement is as long... Uh, so what's the best way to describe this? Let, let me, let's talk about just two spins, okay? Is there anything moving? The, so the photons are moving. The atoms don't move. It just changes which atoms are excited. Right? And, and it's actually a very interesting thing. The requirement for all of this redistribution to happen is real strong coupling between the light and the matter. Right? It all stands fundamentally with the square root of the collective cooperativity here. Because essentially what happens is for that to happen, the photon has the, the excitation has to Robby flop back from this atoms into the cavity and back into a different atomic distribution, right? But the point is that as long as this splitting is large, right, compared to the interaction scale, when you try to make the photons redistribute, the atomic distribution automatically follows it, right? And so this is why you can kind of prove that the optimal number of collisions between photons you can get is the square root of the collective optical depth, right? And so what this means, or within a kind of, well, within a blockade radius or not. And so what this means is that uh, really you optimize your interaction strength and your dark state rotation angle and blah, blah, blah to get to that root optical depth scaling of the, of the number of collisions within the lifetime of a single polariton. Does that answer, more or less? So, John, is there any interesting story with the dispersive part of the EIP? The fact that, that your, your, your dispersion of a, a slow light. So, sorry, you're saying is there any, does that play any role? Yeah. yeah. So, it's actually kind of neat. I told you that the, uh, that the photonic modes have to be degenerate to less than the interaction strength. But that was a lie. Because what happens in practice is that the polariton spends most of its time as a cavity photon, or as a Rydberg atom, right? And so the way you think about this is that, the, that you can say the mass of the polariton gets renormalized compared to the photon mass if you want, but really what it means is that if you have a spectrum, a single particle spectrum for the photons, when you couple to the Rydbergs, the spectrum gets compressed 
by the sine squared of the dark state rotation angle, right? And so, I don't know if that's what you were asking, but yeah, that, that's what happens in practice. And it just has to all fit within your EIT window. Yeah. 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 Yeah.